we had a, a, had a student. She has now been able to go on her own and do her own things in what she wants to do. But when she registered with the school, her uh, mother is a diplomat with the Montenegrin embassy mm. in Beijing. Mm. So when she was posted to Beijing, she and her daughter went. And when they arrived at the airport, the daughter tested positive for COVID. Mm. So she was immediately separated from her mom, 13 years old. Wow. Taken to the hospital for the first 10 days. Then moved to a hotel for 35 days Mm. away from her mom, only digital contact. Mm. And because of this experience, she have has PTSD, Mm -hmm. you know, being removed from her mom. And, and so then her mom is living in the um, residences in the Beijing UN community, like where all the embassies are, mm, okay, and she's true. in the Montenegrin embassy with her daughter, who now the schools in the local area have said, we're all full. We don't mm. have any room for her. So here's this 13-year-old child, basically stuck. It's not like she can yeah. even go for a walk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, she's living in the embassy. She can't go outside unless she has security. Wow. She can't, you know. So she started with us. And so I would meet with her every day. Now we're talking 12 hours difference right, in right. time. <laughs> so at nine o'clock at night, I'm going on and meeting with her at nine o'clock in the morning mm. or vice versa, whichever right, right. she chose. And we would just have conversations Mm -hmm. so that she had some connection. She, and she was interested in doing, so we created a a curriculum for all of her interests Mm, to keep her, but, but across the board, like everything she, she did her physical exercises. She did reading geography. She was especially interested in, in, in theater. Mm. So, That was a challenge because her primary interest was theater. So we're talking about Shakespeare. We're talking about plays. We're watching plays together. We're discussing all uh, how to budget for a a show Mm. to go on Mm -hmm. stage. So just all the different elements because she was basically a prisoner in her own home. Yeah. Yeah. And, and after a year of doing that, she has now been able to overcome a lot of her PTSD because she's had the support through all the interests that she has Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. gained confidence to know she's now 14, almost 15. Mm. And so even just that little bit of contact once a day Mm -hmm. to check in, to make sure she's okay to find out what she's interested in, to support what she's interested in, to be able to allow her to use that as a, as a platform to get herself independently learning. She started doing university courses online Mm. as well to keep herself occupied (laughs) and, uh, (laughs) and interested. And she read lots of books. So she is a definite success story that I can see because that without that freedom, Mm -hmm. she would have had a very difficult time. Yeah, yeah, very cool. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here 
with Gail Hanlon of the Agate Private School in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Um, welcome, Gail. So glad you could join me. I'm so delighted to be here. Yes. Um, so, so to kick us off, um, instead of going into you know just the, we'll, we'll get to the uh, details of the Baptist school, you know, just kind of general description in a minute. But first, tell us a story about someone at your school who really got, uh, you know, really got great value out of being there. You really, really took advantage of what was on offer and 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 really benefited. Oh, I have so many wonderful <laughs> stories. Um, we had a couple of siblings um, mm. that were very inventive. And mm. as they were children, they loved playing with um, puppets. Mm. They loved making puppets. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that really grew into like a business for them. Wow. So in their teenage years, by the time they were teenagers, they already had um, a bunch of plays that they had developed. They had created their own characters. Mm. They had the freedom to do that um, with uh, the self-directed opportunities that they mm. had. They were allowed to flourish in what they loved. So that yeah. became uh, something called Lemon Tree Productions oh. because their their last name was Lemon. <laughs> and uh, and so they, as teenagers, so they were unschooling, homeschooling, basically allowed to do, however, self-directed learning. Mm -hmm. And they were being hired by the school boards to go oh. into the schools as teenagers, as like young teens, we're talking 12, 13, mm. um, going into the schools to do performances on anti-bullying. Mm. So their, their puppeteering was allowed them to take their message of, you know, bullying and anti-bullying, how not to bully, how to do something different than bullying mm. into the places where bullying happens all the time every day wow yeah and uh, eventually they um became so popular that uh in ontario we have the uh tv ontario um it's a government like like the cbc or the 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 government it's like a pbs but not quite right, um, right. so <clears throat> so here they had the youth achievement awards Mm. Uh, for all of Canada. Wow. And they were hosting the awards show. They got so popular. Um, and currently the, the one, the brother has continued mm. and, and still does his, um, the lemon tree productions, the, uh, puppeteering mm. and, uh, is very popular. They've worked on, on TV lots. And uh, yeah, so that's one couple of kids that were able to use their dreams to create their future reality. Nice, nice. Yeah, so that it had that kind of picking up something, really running with it, and then and then develops right through to adulthood. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, when you so know great. you would look at kids and and see them cutting fabric and gluing fabric together and making sock puppets and things like that, and you'd say, you know, stop playing, let's get the work done. Right, right, right. They, their parents, <laughs> they they acknowledge that that was the work. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, that that's really great. Let me let, let's talk about. Um, Kind of the the school and 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 you know kind of its establishment like where did it start or how did it start well i took it over from somebody who already had it so oh, in 19 it was uh started by a, a homeschooling mom hmm. in ontario um and at the time the ministry of education was trying to support alternative schools Nice. Um, and you might have heard about Alpha 2 um, in Toronto. They've been mm. affiliated with the public school board 
right, and okay. still been allowed to have their autonomy as an alternative school in Toronto. Um, and uh, they've been with the ministry since 1972. Nice. So we have had a long history of alternative schools in Ontario. Um, and we have the, the freedom to, in the, in the law, to be completely independent and, hmm. and choose how we do things. Um, in fact, the terminology is um, that uh, a, the definition of a, a private school here in Ontario but it, this diverges, so I can come back to that. What I did was, as a homeschooling mom at the time, I discovered this other mom with this school. Uh -huh. She was her kids were older, and she mm. wanted to let go of it, so I took it over. She had it from 1983 mm. to um, to 1996, which is when I took it over. Okay. So we just actually celebrated 40 years of uh, operating the school. Um, mm. And it's basically the opportunity for people to do what they choose. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to be at the same place because everybody's doing different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're independent learners. They're autodidactic. We're, we're basically not running so much of a uh, pedagogical, but an andragogical where, mm. you know, you ask the question, how do I do this? And, and most homeschoolers will understand this and most alternative schoolers will understand this. You don't have to know everything. You'd say, right. I don't know, let's go find out. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the, um, I took it over then and it had 23 students mm. and uh, learned as I went along. And basically the families were independent mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty much the same as you probably know, West River Academy in California. Oh, um, oh the Peggy. Um, oh, Peggy Webb runs I that. And uh, we're pretty much the same. She has over <laughs> a thousand students. Oh, wow. Okay. But we've been doing the same things. I never really ramped up for registrations. Mm. Um, I, I just let people come at and go as they please, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is fine, which is what I still do. Uh, but of course, over COVID, we had our uh, enrollment surge to like 130 students oh, worldwide. Wow. Okay. Um, and we've been successful in um, providing the opportunity for homeschoolers in countries and places where homeschooling is illegal. Right. France, Germany, um, Quebec, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, so, I mean, my youngest daughter is now 24 in a couple of days. And mm. uh, my oldest daughter is 32. Um, my oldest daughter, I was, she went to university at 13. We oh, wow. eliminated grade levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we never bothered with them. You, if you can do the work, you do it. Yep, yep. And because you're passionate about what you're doing, it creates the environment of a higher order thinking right. instead of the low order thinking that we have at school. Right. Public right. school. So, so do you have, you said you were able to expand to, you know, people internationally during COVID where you, do you have a physical location or is it all sort of. We do have a physical location. It's my home, but <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing is that the, it's with the diversity of things that the students are looking at and doing mm -hmm. one place, one location isn't going to satisfy them. Mm -hmm. Tell, describe what you're providing since they're so independent. So there are fluctuations. Mm. Different years look differently. Okay. What the students need is different. So mm. sometimes I will have kids start out by coming here every day or as often as their, their parents want them to. We also have a connection and partnership with uh, a Montessori school that is a day school 
and after a brief interruption. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. Authenticity, so right? <laughs> and yes, and and he's on the autism spectrum, so mm. I have to make sure I make eye contact and let him know that he's heard. Yeah, yeah. Like every child should. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting because the you know the, there's so much concern about about people on the spectrum, and 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 then there's you know programs and things to meet their needs, uh, and it's ironic Too because. Few. Too, too few, few programs, um, yeah. But it's so ironic because they they are doing exactly what all the kids need. Exactly. <laughs> and the same is true whether they're on the spectrum or or genius or you know like gifted or you know it's like yeah. then they do the things that all the kids need, but they only give it to those kids and they don't give it to all the kids. <laughs> when they ironic. have the when they have the, uh, I always explain it to parents as when your child's learning to walk. Mm. I said, you know, are you? not paying any attention to them or are you like every other parent your arms are out wide mm -hmm, you're mm -hmm. making eye contact with them you're encouraging them you're supporting them and they take those first few steps you didn't tell them how you didn't right. tell them that they should but you are doing the most important thing which is engaging appreciating mm -hmm. accepting and acknowledging what that child is doing Right. If we right. were like that for every single thing that the kids were doing, all exactly. kids would be considered genius. Right. And, <laughs> right. You know, because that's all they need is the support and the encouragement and the love and the care. Right. And that's I have families who contact me from all over the world mm -hmm. with autistic and, and kids on the spectrum. And and they just don't they People in their countries want to put them in asylums or, you know, institutions and the parents have to work. Who's yeah. who's going to be at home to um, engage with those children and give them the attention that they need mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and deserve. Right. Right. And and that's where, you know, our society having a parent at home or older siblings, that kind of thing, that that's where the multi-generational families become so important right right yeah yeah so so um what's your age range okay. uh we go from <laughs> from birth to uh 66 is the oldest student <laughs> i had uh she was a grandma and she wanted to refresh her skills on math and she just wanted mm. some accountability some support some mentoring somebody to do it with yeah nice. so and, and that's a lot of the work that I do with the teenagers. Mm -hmm. If they choose, they can uh, arrange times to meet with me or other people that may be more expert on what they're doing. Other parents. So all the parents that are in the school are um, considered uh, educators. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. though I hate using school tech te terms. <laughs> yeah. um, Wendy Priesnitz just put out a, a reprint of a document of stop. How do we stop using uh, words? How do we stop pretend being like school exists? Let's pretend right, school right. didn't exist. <laughs> uh, right, how do we right. communicate in words that are just positive learning words? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And taking away the uns and the d's and right. you know we don't want to de school we don't want to unschool we just we want to be self directed we want right. to be natural learning we want to be higher order thinking and using all those terms that are more um they're really more descriptive and more accurate to mm -hmm. the type mm -hmm. of learning i don't want to tell people what i don't do right <laughs> tell right. people what i do <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so give us a sense of of you know when kids start developing an interest. So you're providing kind of a, a like you said a companion or an accountability. What, what does that look like? What is it? How does that work? So um, I do have time every day that I have Zoom, so students okay. can come and uh, just 
ask any questions they can, they want. Uh, mm-hmm. Show us the ga- the things that they're doing, the games that they're playing, the programs that they're doing. So mm-hmm. we have 13 and 14 year olds doing online university courses because of course we don't grade, right. um, but also kids that don't want to take courses, but mm-hmm. want to develop their own skills uh, like with art or uh, medicine. They, mm. they just want to learn on their own. So, I mean, you can still take, um, you can still do those explorative things mm-hmm. and appreciate the natural learning that comes along with it. Mm. And when somebody says, oh, that's great shading, you know, and, and kids who are interested in, in languages, they don't necessarily learn the, you know, what's a preposition. I always right. hit uh, uh, public school kids with that, uh, public school parents with that when they say, you know, how are they going to learn this and that and the other thing? And I, I say, you know, so what's the last de- time somebody asked you what a preposition was? Right. You learned it <laughs> in public school. What good did it do you through your life? And I right. still have yet to find a person who never said, when am I ever going to use this? Right. Right. <laughs> so, so isolating the acknowledgement of what they're doing right and not necessarily using school terminology mm-hmm, mm-hmm. using the alternatives to good job you know that's yeah. <laughs> condescending right sometimes so um being able to acknowledge what they're doing as having value right without applying school terminology their uh self-confidence mm-hmm. doesn't evaporate right They'll set, their self-esteem doesn't evaporate you know they're being able to acknowledge and appreciate that yes somebody else sees what they're doing mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. appreciates it for what it is mm. and who they are doing it right 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 yeah and it's really interesting because uh one of the one of the common experiences that people in a variety of schooling that i you know interview and things like that is that they the confidence, the, the ability to interact across generations is really uh, different because they Huge. don't have that intimidation around adults. Um, That's right. And they're able to speak up and, and you know, make a point, uh, you know, have an opinion. <laughs> After a brief interruption. Um, you were talking about uh, Alpha being public. Are, are you also public? You, it says private school, but, but in we America, that means... We are a private means... school. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Alpha is actually with the Board of Education. Okay. It ha- it has been buying up alternative schools. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, they have about twenty one alternative schools in mm-hmm. the Toronto District School Board. Wow. And and so they see the benefit of it, and um, but it's very on the low uh-huh. because right. the the pushback from the conventional system is so much yeah yeah so um no we are not part of the the boards yeah okay we are recognized because here in ontario um the law provides for the two different types of uh private schools Hmm. so private schools do not get government money only Mm -hmm. public schools catholic schools um, so because Alpha is an alternative school that's in the public school, so people can go there and not pay, it's covered by taxes and mm-hmm. they can still have this self-directed, uh, yeah. you know, um, it's a, it's a summer hill, um, mm. Sudbury Valley style. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, we don't get any funding. It's. Mm-hmm simply parents paying what they can when they can yeah or yep. our regular fees are just registration fees mm. because mm-hmm. then everything else will be a la carte you know if you I only see. have to pay 350 dollars for the year and then if if you need help for you know a few hours of coaching or a con- accountability then we just charge that separately and mm-hmm. you're not spending a ton of money on on the school right so it's not a huge income provider is what I'm trying to say Yeah, yeah. yeah. because I believe it shouldn't be. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, you learn, you, you get free, you give free, right? 
So um, as long as I can cover my expenses for the business and the school and myself, then um, whatever I can do to help make it easier for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is what I do. And I have such a huge amount of resources mm. that I, as I was telling one parent this morning, my goal is to become redundant. Yeah. <laughs> I want to empower people to be independent, to go do their own thing and be able to do it well and what they need. And so if any of the information that I have acquired over the last 40 years will help them, then that's what I do. Mm. Um, so not, not big on the uh, cash flow. But yeah. big, 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 big on the providing people with the information they know they, they need to be free and independent. Right, right. Very cool. So, so you're really um, kind of building capacity in your community and now a global community, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, building yeah. capacity in your community to really enable families to really take charge of their own uh, education as families. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, so, so are there, so homeschooling is different everywhere. Um, I mean, in America, it's different for every state and it sounds like it's different for every province in Canada. So it's different for every person. Yeah. Yeah. That's too. That's true. Yeah. You know, yeah. my two biological daughters, one was an, an academic junkie. Mm. She, she was doing grade four level stuff at four. Um, only because I, I let her do what she was interested in. Mm -hmm. She loved the alphabet letters. She took the flashcards to bed with her instead of stuffed <laughs> animal. Like this kid was crazy. And I'm thinking, here I am trying to unschool. And and she's like so into the academics. Right, but right. Uh, yeah, so she's the one that went to university at 13. She uh -huh, started yeah. auditing university courses at nine, not because I made her, but because she had the curiosity. Right. And right. And I had the uh, the other kids, that are, and I had a home daycare at the time as well. So I took all of us with yeah, the stroller yeah. and the you know and the babies and the diaper bag and into the back of the lecture hall. And right, right. So now, do you yeah. have uh, the does the state have requirements for w no. what you do or what the families do? Okay, not none at all. Okay, okay. I I say none at all, but the the legalities are that you have to operate any time and i'm going to stress that because it's so great any time between the hours of nine and four mm. on any school day oh interesting so you could literally have a private school in ontario that operated for five minutes on a monday <laughs> <laughs> how interesting <laughs> you you are not required to follow the ontario curriculum mm -hmm. Although you have to be prepared to offer any courses that from that curriculum should uh, somebody ask it, right? Yeah, okay. So we have that. We have that. Nobody <laughs> has ever, ever asked for the ministry curriculum. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, um, so we don't have, and, that, and that's it. That mm. That's it. So anytime any school day and have five or more pupils. Right. Full time. And full time could be that five minutes because right, right. full time is, you know, yeah, it's absolutely free, which is nice. beautiful and lovely and wonderful. Right. Right. There's no, you don't have to register with anybody. All the ministry wants from me is statistics. Okay. Um, about how many females, how many males, mm. uh, how many uh, approximate grade levels. And okay. we have the category U for ungraded. Mm. So we can put U if they're ungraded. Okay. So all yours are U's. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All of ours are U's. <laughs> right on. Right on. Um, well, that that's really interesting. And and um, so so... It sounds like most of what you do is is more consultative and facilitative than kind of providing instruction. Is that accurate? Yes and no. I mean, I am able to provide instruction and I, I hate that because I can't make somebody understand anything, mm. but I can expose them to mm. different ideas 
and and things that they might not have thought of yet. I can help them mm. make connections, right. Um, right? Like the the uh, the show uh, connections. If you're familiar, oh with right, it. right, it, James, yeah, Burke. It's yeah, James Burke, yeah. Now it's been re- redone. Oh really? Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's updated, so it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I. Once again, it's it's a huge go to for uh, critical thinking. Yeah. yeah, and and that's the thing. I I guess my if I had to say I want something for the kids, it would be I want them to know that it's their choice, and mm. what we provide is choice rather than compulsion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if they want to learn, I worked for NASA for six years. Mm. So if if they want to know what it's like to work for NASA, I can do that. Right. I can show them all the programs that we we were, I was working with, and because I was the um, educational coordinator uh, and distributor for all of Canada for NASA, oh, for all their educational materials. Mm-hmm. So that gave me access to a ton of people, yeah, and a ton of resources at NASA, and. Um, and and also just being able to help um, kids fine tune what they're doing. Okay, mm. so you want? I had one girl come to me and say, "I want to be a mechanical engineer," and mm. and then I said, "Well, what does that mean?" There are mm-hmm. a million different types of engineering and right, right. mechanical engineering, di- zillion different places. You know, what's the purpose? She and she liked the um, the thinking, mm. the critical thinking, the understanding of how things worked together, how right. the creative process was, the scientific process in there, and uh, and so helping her find the courses that are already out there. Mm. Yeah. Um, which I don't need to replicate because somebody yeah. else who's much more qualified than I am, I'm not, a, I don't know how to play the violin. I can't teach you how to play the violin, yeah. but I can help you find the best dang violin player or teacher in yeah. the area or where you are. Um, so it's not much different than, you know, when you look at a, a school curriculum, mm-hmm. they're all providing the same things. It's just different. Right. Right, right, right. Um, because right. everything that they have to teach in the school comes from real life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're we're just the way I look at it is we're deconstructing school, mm. right, right, <laughs> and providing those real life experiences again. Uh, yeah, allowing uh, value from cooking, from horseback riding, from you know mm-hmm. whatever it is the kids want to do. And nice, one nice. place cannot lo- cannot provide all of that for every different individual student, right, but we right. can because we use the resources in our community, their communities, online. Because now, of course, we have access to pretty much anything, right, right, um, right. which yeah. is its own hazards. But yes, <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, but but that also you know uh, makes what people call digital literacy being something that is going to be inherent to what you do as well is, is helping and making sure that they're accessing resources that are appropriate. And, 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 exactly. you know, if something alarming comes up, then you have to you know deal with it. And, and the critical thinking of how to determine where the information is coming from, whether it's legitimate and accurate or not, right. Mm-hmm. Questioning mm-hmm. those things like is, you know, you can pretty much find, anything you want Mm -hmm. on any side of an argument right you can find support for yep so how how do you really know what's true and false Mm -hmm. anymore Mm -hmm. um because if you can back up with documentation everything that you can argue um it's it's just that thinking and a choice right 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 um so valuing that logic and critical thinking skills of keep diving keep mm-hmm. going down mm-hmm. that rabbit hole until you find what is the closest thing to truth that you can right 
right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 having that sort of conversation um, yeah. because you know acknowledging, yeah, you can find every side of the argument. So, what what criteria are you using to judge? What you know? What disqualifies something? What qualifies something? What makes something exactly? Um, yeah. It's a really interesting uh, process um, because you know. <clears throat> One of the things that I, uh, so, so my, my, I homeschooled other people's kids for about five years, uh, about late 90s, yeah. early 2000s. Um, and, and similar to you in a sense of, of just, I was bringing kids to my place and then we'd go and explore yeah. the community. So the community was yeah. the primary learning yeah. resource, you know. Um, yeah. But part of that was, you know, uh, getting on the public buses and saying, okay, you mm -hmm. know, looking around, who's, who's on the bus today? <laughs> you know, should we stay away from somebody? Or uh, one time, uh, we sat down on the bus and, and near the front, near the driver and actually right behind the driver. And there was a, a young, so I had at least two or three, seven, eight ish year olds. And, and, uh, a young man gets on, um, by his facial characteristics, probably on the spectrum. Uh, but he sits down and then he sort of you know, does some alarming things. Uh, and so we're like, oh, okay, we're going to move seats. You know, we didn't have to make a scene or anything, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. we did like, oh, let's recognize that, you know, <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, you know, behave appropriately. Um, and, and so that's something that, that we definitely, you know, you know, it, it, but that's reality. That's, that's dealing that's with real people. Life. Um, you know, we saw I, the homeless people in the, you know, in the U.S., that's a big deal. So, uh, you I know, love... how to deal with it. Yeah, I love using that example. We did the same thing. Um, when I have kids that are here every day, we would uh, do those things. And part of that was to encourage literacy. Right. You know, right. we're getting on a bus. Which bus? Mm -hmm. How do we know where it's going? Then it gets into mapping, right? Where are we yep. going? Let's yep. look at a map. You know, back and in the day, no digital maps, but that's right. you know, yeah, but yeah, we did that too. It's, it's very much, you know, uh, yeah. embedding it in their desire to go someplace and see something or do something. Um, and then they have this motive to then, oh, exactly. Well, you know, and, and as a responsible adult, it's not like <clears throat> I'm going to tell you all the things I'm going to say, okay, how should we get there? What, what do we know about this bus? What do we, you know? And on it goes. And that's the exact definition of higher order thinking. Right. Because it's what is relevant. So I will always ask parents, like, okay, you learn more when you're interested in something. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in something, you learn it faster, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. retain it longer, and you can use it in everyday life. Right. That's right. higher order thinking. If if it's not relevant to your life, then it's nonsense. Right, right. If it has no relevance, there's no reason to remember it. Yeah. And so that lower order thinking in school of memorization and, and you know, I'm not saying memorization doesn't work. It right, does. Right. <laughs> I have to memorize things that that are important to me. I will memorize them if they're That's important right. to me, if they have relevance. If yeah, they don't right. have relevance, you might remember it, but it won't have any real uh, relevance and yeah, the yeah. majority of the time you don't remember it right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know we do sometimes have little memories pop up from our public my public school experience was very different than than most and mm. because i was born in england raised in brazil and montreal oh, and nice. and so i i had um school in in brazil um from monday to saturday from 7 a.m to 11 a.m Mm. And because it was too hot to go to school, oh, yeah, to go to yeah. a building after 11 a.m., you would. So after 11 a.m., you're done. Mm -hmm. You're out. You're, you know, you're at the beach. You're with your friends. You're doing whatever. Um, so it and everybody was up in the morning because it was so hot. Mm -mm. Uh, so from seven till 11, Monday through mm. Saturday. And that's how they got everything in. Um but even then it was a lot like we had people um uh do uh scraping animal skins oh, we yeah. had okay. like so many different experiences mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. there 
and I lived both in the hills and in Rio de Janeiro, uh, mm. close to the, the ocean. So lots of different experiences there. But then in, in Montreal, that was very different too, because the FLQ, which I, may not be, most people don't know, there was a terrible, um, if you, <clears throat> it was a group of people trying to force Canadians who lived in Quebec to all uh, choose French and be uh, their own country. It okay. was the separatists. Yep. Okay. Right. So it it's like the um, the the Quebec um, or no, not the Quebec, the um, IRA in oh, okay. in you know, if you think that way. So we had bombs being planted in the schools. We had, we had these terrorists going, riding motorcycles through the schools Hmm. just to disturb English schools. Wow. So it was horrifying. And then I went to boarding school in England, Hmm. which was a totally different, you know, experience (laughs) because I was only eight years old when I went to boarding school in England. So I was 4,000 miles away from my family. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, I remember doing flashcards. I, but what I may remember most is not what I learned from those classes, right, right. <laughs> but from, you know, the experience of being on, uh, in the area. Mm-hmm. Nice. So, so my experience and, and my grandfather was a scientist, so he never, uh, forced me to go anywhere Hmm. where whenever we moved it was convenient for them to have me in school it was still a daycare kind of thing right Hmm. after a brief interruption the independence factor that came Mm -hmm. from that was huge and it's in in europe it's very normal to send your kids away at eight right to boarding school so i was in an international boarding school that had kids from all over nice um, and it's, it's not done here really. It's right, not right. the, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's but, only a rare, you know, there, there are a bunch of boarding schools on the East coast, uh, of the U S but yeah, it's not, it's not really a common thing yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, actually we have a, an elite private school in our, in Oregon here, not too far away. I haven't inv- yeah. investigated them very thoroughly, but. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. You know, the diversity of experiences really is right. Uh, quite interesting. And my grandfather, being the scientist that he was, he always taught me: if you don't find what you want, make it. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, it was never. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, okay, I'll give up. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, so I was always embedded with that critical thinking. Okay, if I can't, if somebody else hasn't done it, how do I do it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do I find who can do it? Right. Um, and that's one of the things that I try to pass on to the kids that I'm affiliated with is because, you know, don't give up. Mm-hmm. Um, we mm-hmm. often we watch Masterclass and mm-hmm. uh, like Masterclass.com and Richard Branson is on there saying, I would never hire somebody because they had a degree. Mm-hmm. I don't have a degree. I quit school at 15. Right. You know, I, I was in a high school band that never we did couldn't find somebody to sign us. So hmm. I created a mu- music label. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, hit an obstacle, overcome it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that gets at the, you know, the, the title of the whole series here is agentic schools is really emphasizing yeah. that agency and, and, and it's amazing how many different ways people have found to do that. Um, yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, doing it as a, a facilitator of homeschooling through a private school is like, okay, that's how it's done there. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, and yeah, it, exactly. it has so many different variations. It's amazing. Um, but, it, but I, you know, throughout everything you've said, it's really clear that that sort of, that, that comes through really clear is, you know, facilitating, ensuring the kids are empowered to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also, okay, what support do they need? Uh, what, what kind of accountability do they, do the parents need or the, or the grandmother, you know, picking up on her math skills or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but really it, it, the underlying core of it is that agency, that ability to, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. tune in to he, what it is you're up to and do it. Right. 
And, and I want to address something because people have asked me, you know, what, so what's the benefit? What's the difference between mm. me just going off and homeschooling on my own or joining your school? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and the biggest difference is that community mm-hmm. that you're not, a, I mean, yes, you'll have homeschooling communities, but sometimes they can be very um, tricky mm-hmm. to navigate. Uh, because the diversity is so much. Yeah. So whoever's running the program would set the boundaries, right? Right. right. Um, <laughs> and, and set the expectations. And if it's in a church that you don't attend, whether, you know, because they're using that facility. Um, and again, you get into this, it is that, that fluctuating, um, like, somebody teaching yoga and you don't want your children to learn yoga and Mm -hmm, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. You don't have to uh, ascribe to any one particular thing. Right. But here the community is, we are a community of people who think differently, Mm -hmm, support mm -hmm. each other regardless of our own opinions. Right. Right. And have our records out of the system and sent to this school. Cause that is one of the big, perks Mm. is that people who have had their kids in the public system and so their all their information is in the school Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. keep getting harassed when they're homeschooling Mm. individually right right. and because the school system uh when you pull your child out of a school they lose 15 to 25 thousand dollars a year right because we have a per student funding model right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so those schools it affects their pocketbook when you take your kids out of school. But when you transfer them to a private school, Mm -hmm. they still lose the money, but they don't distrust you. Right. Right. So here the negative um, mistrust of the term homeschooling Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, is, is very, um, it, it creates uh, a, an environment where people feel intimidated right? because they're under a microscope of somebody saying, hey, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Fortunately, in Ontario, we have a law that sadly, nobody in the school system is ever taught what the Education <laughs> right. Act. Seriously, they do not teach a course in teacher's college on the Education Act. Right. This is right. something that blows my mind. <laughs> Why would you go into an industry and not know the laws that encompass it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so we have Section 21-2A of the Education Act in Ontario that states a person is excused, not may be excused. Mm-hmm. You're not getting mm-hmm. permission. Right. Is excused from attendance at school. If satisfactory instruction is being provided at home or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, Mm -hmm. critical to this is there is no definition of satisfactory instruction. (laughs) Right, right. The the ministry curriculum is not the default Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. education pattern. It is not considered the bar that all satisfactory instruction is judged by. Right. Or, you know, looked at. Um, satisfactory instruction might be different for a Hasidic Jewish family than an Amish family, than, uh, you know, an autistic child, a blind child, a deaf child, any, any child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Satisfactory instruction is going to be individual. Yeah. Yeah. There is no way to define it. So they haven't defined it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when the school boards and the teachers think, oh, no, this child should not be excused from attendance at school, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they would have to start an investigation Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. led by somebody who's not employed by the school system Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to investigate and determine whether satisfactory instruction is being provided or not. Mm. (laughs) However, the when it goes to court, the the um, if it goes to court, which it used to go to court, but it doesn't anymore, um, because of this, they were losing every case because mm-hmm. the um, 
the onus was on the school boards to prove that the families were not providing satisfactory instruction. Right, right. Well, since there's no definition of satisfactory instruction and they have no information about what the parents are doing and mm -hmm. they're not entitled to any information of right. what the parents are doing, they kept losing these cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ministry finally said, whoa, we have to stop taking parents to court. <laughs> We're spending millions on legal fees that we uh, don't need to um, and, and shouldn't have to. After a brief interruption. So the ministry said, stop taking families to court. Mm -hmm. And instead, they, they created this policy memorandum 131. Mm. which um, says if choosing to homeschool, a parent should notify the board. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. you go to the, the Toronto District School Board's website, it says a parent must. Mm. But that's not the wording of the actual policy. Right. And right. policy is not law. Mm -hmm. So this policy applies to the school boards is not a, applied to the parents. It is a, would you please tell us what you're doing with your children? Right. <laughs> Except they've decided to interpret it as, you must tell us what you're doing with your children. You must register because it's our responsibility to keep tabs on who's homeschooling. Right, right. In their job description, not in the law. Right, right. <laughs> so, so this is where it, now they're trying to surreptitiously or covertly get this information from mm. homeschooling families so that they can say, hey, look, all these families have complied and provided a letter of intent to homeschool. They must acknowledge us as the authority mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that in the future, they may come a time when they do want to make it law. Right. right. And they have that proof and documentation. So that's why I... You know, I work with the Ontario Federation of Teaching Parents mm, to mm -hmm. try and help get this information out so that people know their rights. Right. right. And provide them the alternative of doing uh, a private school. We have others like it. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. um, there are there are few and far between. Right. But right. Uh, yeah, um, there are the options and. The Ontario government supports those options. Right. And I've created right. a document that I can send to you if uh, if you're interested that gives all that information. Well, speaking because... of accessing information, um, <laughs> yes. uh, how do people find you if they want to? Learnfree.ca. Nice. Nice. Learnfree.ca. And I'm on every platform available for social <laughs> media as well. Very cool. So uh, pretty much learn free. Uh, you'll find me on X and Facebook and uh, everywhere. Nice, nice. All yeah. right. Well, thank you very much, Gail. This has been wonderful. Um, as we as we wrap up, um, let's wrap with a story. So, so tell me again. Tell me a story of a challenge that that you faced or that that a, a learner faced, um, and that at the end of it, they came through it and they, you know learn something or got something valuable or the school was better for it. Absolutely. Um, we had a, a, had a student. She has now been able to um, go on her own and do her own things in what she wants to do. But when she registered with the school, her uh, mother um, is a diplomat with the Montenegrin embassy mm. in Beijing. Hmm. So, um, when she was posted to Beijing, she and her daughter went. And um, when they arrived at the airport, the daughter tested positive for COVID. Mm. So she was immediately separated from her mom, 13 years old. Wow. Taken to the hospital for the first 10 days. Then moved to a hotel for 35 days. Mm. Away from her mom. Only digital contact. Mm. And because of this experience, she be, have, has PTSD. I bet. Mm -hmm. You know, being removed from her mom. And, and so then her mom is living in the um, residences in the Beijing uh, 
UN community, like where all the embassies are. Mm, okay, and she's true. in the Montenegrin embassy with her daughter, who now the schools in the local area have said, uh, we're all full. We don't mm. have any room for her. So here's this 13 year old child basically stuck. It's not like she can yeah. even go for a walk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, she's living in the embassy. She can't go outside unless she has security. Wow. She can't, you know, so she started with us. And so I would meet with her every day. Now we're talking 12 hours different. Right, in right. Time. <laughs> so at nine o'clock at night, I'm going on and meeting with her at nine o'clock in the morning mm. or vice versa, whichever right, right. she chose. So and and we would just have conversations mm -hmm. so that she had some connection. Yeah. She uh, and she was interested in doing so we created a, a curriculum for all of her interests mm, nice. to keep her, but, but across the board, like sure. everything she, she did her physical exercises. She did um, reading geography. She was especially interested in, um, in, in theater. Mm. So that was a challenge because her primary interest was theater. So we're talking about Shakespeare. We're talking about plays. We're watching plays together. We're discussing all the, how to budget for a, a show mm. to go on mm -hmm. stage. So just all the different elements um, because she was basically a prisoner in her own home. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and after a year of doing that, she has now been able to overcome a lot of her PTSD nice. because she's had the support through all the interests that she has mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and gained confidence to know she, she's now 14, almost 15. Mm. And uh, so even just that little bit of contact once a day mm -hmm. to check in, to make sure she's okay to find out what she's interested in, to support what she's interested in, to be able to allow her to use that as a, as a platform to get herself independently learning. Mm -hmm. She started doing at, you know, um, she started doing university courses online mm. as well to keep herself occupied yep, yep. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and interested. And she read lots of books. So she is a definite success story um, nice. that I can see because that without that freedom, mm -hmm. she would have had a very difficult time. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very nice. All right, Gail. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, um, and and uh, thank you again. I really appreciate it. You are very, very welcome. I hope it's not too much editing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs>has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic Schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.